Welcome back to the archive. If you haven't seen the first episode, aka May 2008, go check it out now for an intro to this series. Anyway, the first video starts off like this. Okay, today I want to talk to you about the difficulties of downloading Wikipedia. The difficulty of downloading Wikipedia, because yes, most people just wake up one morning and decide they want to download the whole of Wikipedia. I'm going to tell you about downloading Wikipedia. Now first I just want to quickly give you a general idea on what Wikipedia actually is. To access Wikipedia, the online version of Wikipedia, because not many people know you can download it, I didn't actually realise you could download it until today, but anyway, you just double click on your favourite web browser. I never use Google Chrome, so I'll use Google Chrome. Back then, Firefox was my favourite web browser, and I never touched Google Chrome, even though I had it installed, but now in 2019, it's pretty much the opposite. You search for something you want, for instance, if you want to look up information about the dogs, you just type in the word dog, and then you'll get a bit of info on dogs. Go down. The domestication of dogs occurred more than 15,000 years ago. Anyway, there's a bunch of articles on different sort of dogs, and dogs cobutating, I don't know what that means, but anyway. Dogs, dogs, and a bunch of links, and all this information. Look, there's so much stuff on dogs here that I'm pretty sure you're going to get sick of dogs. This video's already getting me sick of dogs. Let's just skip to the actual process of downloading Wikipedia. What about downloading Wikipedia? So I'm going to search in Wikipedia. Download. Wikipedia database download. If I download Wikipedia, that means that I don't have to be on the internet to view it, so I can view Wikipedia anywhere that I want to view it. Back then, I didn't have a phone with a data plan that I could view anywhere, and my school laptop had no access to the internet while I was at school, so downloading an offline version of Wikipedia, as dumb as it sounds now, was actually quite important to me back then, although downloading it wasn't easy. The most simplest version of Wikipedia you can download, the smallest one, pages articles.xml.bz2. That file allows you to download current revisions only. That means you can't download history of pages, but you don't even get talk pages or user pages or any of that. Honestly, most people wanting an offline Wikipedia backup would just want the articles themselves. Not all the talk pages and history, but anyway, the size of the download will surprise you. Now the thing is, this file is 5 gigabytes compressed. You're thinking, oh, it shouldn't take too long to download. Download, um, the download speed's good, the download speed's actually great, the download speed is one megabyte per second. When you have internet, you go on a plan, like they say, for this whole month, you're not allowed to download more than 25 gig, otherwise your internet will be slowed to 8 kilobytes per second, which you can't really use. A 5 gig download now is pretty much nothing, but back then in Australia, with limited data on home internet, it was an absolute nightmare. And the 60 gigabytes it took up uncompressed on a laptop with a hard drive size of barely one 20 gigs was brutal, but I managed it, and everyone at school thought it was so cool that I had every Wikipedia article offline on my MacBook. Don't go trying to download the Wikipedia dump that has all the talk and revision history though, it's multiple terabytes. Anyway, time to move on to the next video. This is Jasmine. Jasmine, you see one mum over there, now she does this quite often. This video is literally Jasmine laying asleep on Mama while I ask random questions, and it's super boring until I ask a question that comes out completely wrong. Is there any part of Jasmine you particularly enjoy? <laughs> is there any part of Jasmine you particularly enjoy? It sounds creepy when you put it like that, but what I meant to say was, what do you like most about Jasmine? Anyway, this episode's been pretty dull, so it's time for a laugh. Okay, today Today is a very big day in history because this is the day today. It's the day that my sister over there, Jasmine, laughed. Dad caught it on this audio recording device. Wow, what an intro. I don't see the date of Jasmine's first laugh marked in any history books, and that device is just a phone, but anyway, let's hear the laugh. Now listen, this is my sister Jasmine laughing. So that was her laughing, and as you can see, she's over there. So Jasmine, you know what you've done? You've done your first laugh. 
<laughs> oh, yuck. And then she vomits. Jasmine at this point still vomited at least three times an hour, but trust me, milk vomits aren't anywhere near as bad as food vomits. So Jasmine, I am now rewarding you for laughing. Goodbye Jasmine and congratulations. <laughs> really? That's the best reward I could come up with, just saying the word congratulations, but then again, I'm just rewarding her for laughing. It's not like it's an amazing accomplishment. <laughs> Pink elephant. Are you gonna laugh at that pink elephant? Well, the Jasmine of today has certainly laughed at that pink elephant, but back then, getting Jasmine to laugh was really difficult. I am nipples. Angry. <laughs> we didn't have any luck making Jasmine laugh here, so let's just move on to when I play around with text to speech. And you use the keys to type in words, and these words will be said by the computer. And you need to type in what you want. For instance, I could type in hello, I am. And then you can click say it. Hello, I am a text to voice speaking thing. You can type in anything you want. You can type in bad words if you like. <laughs> By bad words, you'd assume that I'm saying you can even make the computer swear and curse, but no. My concept of bad words was a little different. I have just done a massive poo in the toilet. <laughs> Yeah, back then, I actually found it amusing when computers talked about their bathroom habits. I have won one million dollars and I am very happy. And you can even do sort of different languages like French person if they were trying to say it, for instance, Claire. Il y a voilà million de dollars and I am very happy. Is that what a French person really sounds like when they win the lotto? What about a Turkish person? <laughs> as funny as this all sounds, it's time to move on to the next video that features Jasmine's reaction to having a bath. <laughs> yeah, Jasmine always had a funny face when getting into the bath, but anyway, nothing else really happened in this video apart from night shot causing more demon eyes, so let's move on. Tonight, I want to show you Another session of Jasmine laughing. Okay, this is today. <laughs> Don't you wish my dad just recorded her with the video camera rather than just audio on the phone? Well, don't worry. In future episodes, you will see plenty of videos with Jasmine laughing. Anyway, it's time to move on to more serious matters. Okay, today I have some quite bad news. Um, we found out that my Nana, the one you've seen in a few archive videos, she's got cancer that spread to her liver, and because it's in her liver, it means she, today, because she's living in today's time, 2009, there's no cure for cancer in liver and it just means she's going to die very soon. She's in the hospital right now and she's just, you know, they're doing chemotherapy but there's nothing else they can do to actually stop it. They can just slow down the cancer. I hope you've enjoyed seeing my Nana, how I got to catch her on an archive before she passed away. Probably will not be any more archive videos from her because she's never going to leave hospital for the rest of her life. Sadly, at this point, there was no hope left for Nana and she passed away 20 days later. You'll see part of a funeral in the next episode but for now we'll skip the next video discussing the end of the world in 2012 and instead move on to the next video. Mum today for the first time used Bongella. Now that's a special cream that allows babies to, it stops them from teething, well it stops the pain from the teething. Well you'd hope the cream wouldn't stop the development of teeth. Anyway, time to listen to some funny voice messages left on our home phone by various people. We're worried our phone's about to break down, so here are a few funny message recordings that are currently on our phone. The first one is from a nice old lady who thanked my mum for a Christmas card, but the background music from the place she was standing in made this message sound very holy. Oh, Dabby, I'm Dabby, the Shani Pontifine ringing to say thank you so much for the lovely card you sent me. That was so sweet of you. I did appreciate it. And it's a beautiful card. <laughs> All right, I'll try and contact you again. Not tonight, but some other soon. Bye-bye. The next message has my voice in it as I answered the phone here, but I couldn't tell if this next person was an old lady or just my mum putting on a funny voice as a prank. Oh, hello. Is this, um, where is this? Where is mum? Um, she's not home, is she? No. 
Oh, did you think I could get it on the mobile? It turns out that this was a real person, and to stop myself from laughing, I tried talking as little as possible. But when she continues to say yes as I repeat the digits of my mum's phone number, I almost lose it. But I want to, I want to tell you the mobile. I'm not sure I've got the right number. Okay. Zero four four seven seven three seven four. Is that correct? Okay, I'll just repeat that to you. So you said O four four. Yes. Seven seven. Yes. Three. Yes. Seven four. And then seven four. Yeah. Okay, I'll ring that number then. She she'll answer me, won't she? On that number. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll try that. Thank you, Philip. Bye. She can tell by the way I simply go, mm, that I'm so close to laughing that I can't even speak properly. Anyway, next up you can take a listen to the leave a message after the beep that I recorded onto the phone when I was around seven or eight years old. You have reached Diana, Ben and Philip We can't take your call right now. Please leave a message after the beep. Yeah, that certainly was a cute greeting, but anyway, we'll skip the next video where I discuss the plans Adobe had for adding the ability to make iPod games within Adobe Flash Professional, and instead move on to my Year 9 exam results. Today I want to talk to you about my results of all my exams, because I now know the results of all of them. First of all, the math exam, out of 60 people, the top mark was 91%. The bottom mark, I'm not 100% sure, but I know the average was 62%, and I got 87.5%, so I went very close to the top mark in math. Math and computers were one of my strongest subjects, but now let's discuss a weaker subject. Geography. I got 64%. I'm not too good at geography, but guess what? Above the class average. See if you can beat those results. Remember these were the year nine yearly exams. But anyway, Jasmine, try and beat my results. <laughs> yeah, Jasmine, try and beat those results. I mean, back then she was only a few months old and I'm already thinking of her attempting to beat my high school exam results. Anyway, time to move on. Okay, one thing that you have to do when you're at school are speeches. Now, speeches are usually written on palm cards, which are sort of cut up bits of paper. But I'm going to read my speech to you. Here we go. My speech is called The Future of the Internet. Back then, I always imagined crazy future technologies, and this speech really goes over the top with my ideas and vision of the future. When most of us think about the internet today, it's a big part of our lives. Teenagers mainly use it for entertainment, chatting to friends, and researching information for their assignments. The internet in the past was much different to this. On August 6, 1991, the world's first website was put online. It was extremely basic, containing only text. As the internet evolved, so did all the websites. Slowly new features started coming through. First pictures, then videos, and interactive games and tours. So basically I'm saying we first had text, then images, videos, and interactive tours and games and so on, but then I start to imagine... What's going to be next? Imagine what the next thing on the internet will be. The internet can currently store videos and photos, but what will it be able to store in the future? Maybe shopping online will completely change from looking at items online and ordering them to be delivered to your door, to the computer instantly giving you the items. Just like you can print out Word documents off the computer straight onto paper, maybe we could print our shopping out and eat it. Same with other items, we could print out TVs, tables, and maybe even people. (laughs) The whole class laughed at the idea of 3D printed humans, it. Right now in 2019, this speech is sounding a lot more believable. It wasn't until 2011 that 3D printers were more well known about by the public and in 2014, the first 3D food printer came out, five years after I made my prediction about 3D printed food and since then, food printers have become much better, being able to print a much wider range of food. As for 3D printing humans, in 2019 the first ever human heart was 3D printed with real human tissue that includes vessels, collagen and biological molecules. One day this technology will replace the need for organ donors. My idea of 3D printing humans though was more along the lines of using it as a way of teleportation, where you walk into a machine in Australia to be broken apart and within a few seconds, recreated and printed out in a another place in the world with your mind transferred to the new recycled body. The 2045 initiative and Neuralink are the closest we have in 2019 to achieving this ability. If we could move items using the internet, imagine what it would be like transferring people over the internet. Think about it, you wake up one morning, get ready for school and type www.whateverschoolyougoto.com into your web browser. 
then all of a sudden you were at school. Wouldn't it be much better catching the internet to school than catching a bus to school? <laughs> you can imagine how the class roared out in laughter here, and honestly, that was a really poor example of what I'm going to label IBT, Internet-Based Teleportation. Virtual reality technology access from students' homes would be a lot more accessible and beneficial as opposed to deconstructing and reconstructing every school kid every weekday to get them to and from school. Anyway, just when you think this speech couldn't get any more crazy, it gets way more crazy than you could ever imagine. When you think about it, our tiny computers are capable of games which have a massive amount of worlds to walk around and explore on screen. We are very quickly running out of resources for everything. What we really need to do is start living on the internet, rebuilding our whole world and chuck it online so everyone can do whatever they want whenever they want. Sick of war in the world is put all the people who want to fight on one server and everyone who wants peace and relaxation on another server. In fact, we can have whatever worlds we want. Who says the worlds we create online have to all be set in 2009? Some old people may want the good old days, which they miss so much. That's no problem, because we can just create a world set in the 1960s. The amount of worlds and places we can create is almost unlimited. Everyone will be happy being where they want to be. Yeah, let's all just live on the internet and stick people on different servers and worlds based on their matching world views, so there's no more suffering in the world and instead just pure happiness. I mean, it's a brilliant idea from a scientific perspective, but I was seeing this speech at a Christian high school, so you can imagine the laughter in the room slowly turning into anger. Here. If we can generate complete worlds and walk around online and actually be inside the computer taking no space at all, population problems will be fixed. Food problems will be fixed. We'll never need to go back to the real world. Humans can just be virtual beings living happy online forever and never having a worry. Just to clarify, I wasn't referring to a matrix situation here with a bunch of bodies and brains connected to machines. I was thinking of the consciousness of every human being being digitized and uploaded into a global virtual world with no need for a human body that requires food or water. So in this case, yes, population problems, resource limitations, eventual death and every possible issue you could think of would no longer exist. The only issue is actually achieving this level of advancement, which I doubt will happen in any of our lifetimes. Anyway, my speech isn't done yet. I've still got another problem to solve. Some people may now be thinking, but what if the whole earth blows up and falls apart and all the computers hosting these worlds suddenly break down. Well, there's a very simple solution to that. All we need to do is store more than one of each server. For example, one server for each world on each planet of our solar system. That way, if one planet blows up or something happens, we'll be safe since there are server backups and we can instantly be transported to another server. <laughs> Great! A backup of every human stored on every planet. But my time frame for actually achieving this is completely messed up. A lot of people are currently terrified of an upcoming date, 21st December 2012, which for thousands of years has been marked the end of the world. If 2012 really is the end of the world, we can survive with the internet. If we live on the internet, we are nowhere and everywhere at once. If we start now, we can save the world. The internet is our only future. If we live on the internet, we live forever. So that's my speech that I wrote. Yeah, that was quite a speech. A teacher actually wanted a copy of this to share with a future class, but anyway, we've spent plenty of time on this speech, so it's time to move on. Okay, we have finally set up Jasmine's cot over there. Now, Jasmine will not immediately be moving to her cot. It's just been set up there for now. So basically, as you can see, Jasmine's cot is just in front of my bed. So when I lie down, my bed, like that, Jasmine will be right down there. She's probably going to be there by January 2010, so we're not sure of the exact date. Remember, currently she's just in my parents' room in a pram. I hope you've enjoyed looking at Jasmine's cot in the video. I'm not sure what there is to enjoy about that, but anyway. The next video just discusses some stats I collected at school, finding out that most people in our class prefer spending time on the computer as opposed to watching TV, and that M-rated movies were the most popular for grade 9 students. So let's move on to the last video of the month. Jasmine currently sleeps in a, a sort of pram in my parents' room, but after she's out of that pram, she'll have to go into this cot here, which is that black rectangular prism-shaped object in front of my 
bed. Black rectangular prism shaped object is the funniest description of a cot I've ever heard. But anyway, this video is me guessing when Jasmine will start sleeping in a cot. I guess. January 14th, 2010. So that's my guess. The only problem is Dad doesn't want her in that cot there. Because Dad just wants her to be a little baby in his room. But no, nah, she's going to be there one day. <laughs> yeah, if you didn't know, Jasmine eventually grows up one day. She doesn't stay a baby forever. Anyway, we've come to the end of this episode, so I'll see you guys in the next episode featuring December 2009. The month where I run Windows on my iPod Touch and Jasmine eats cereal for the first time. I'll see you then.